You are listening to a Monash Christian Union Bible Talk. We encourage you to share this with friends and family, but ask that you do not edit it without the permission of the owners. This Bible Talk is designed to supplement belonging to a local church with its teaching and community, not to replace it. We pray this talk helps you love Jesus and become more like Him. Well, hello everyone. It's Joel here. I thought I'd just jump in and introduce this fireside chat because it's a little bit different. Uh, This conversation will run for about 35 minutes or so with Stu and it arranges a bunch of different things. But the main thing that it talks about is what is CU? And so if you're listening to this and you're not a part of CU and you're on campus, we'd love to invite you along. Hopefully, it's helpful for understanding why CU is important. Uh, But if you are a CU student, hopefully this helps give you some background into Uh, CU and AFES and how that works, but we'd also love it um, if you think about giving this to your family or your friends, uh, this particular podcast, to help them understand why you're part of CU and what CU is all about. And so we can use it in that way too. Uh, So please enjoy this and hopefully it's helpful in understanding uh, Stu and some of uh, CU AFES, how that works. Welcome Stu to Fireside Chats. Uh, which is actually your invention uh, originally, as in the term fireside chat. I've only ever heard you use it before. Really? Yeah. But here I think we are. it predates me quite some way, but I'm I'll sure. Take it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least this iteration is, uh, is your thing. Yeah. Uh, I feel like most people know a fair bit about you, mm-hmm. um, but probably don't know everything. So tell us who, who is Stu? Um, yeah. How would you define yourself? Wow. The other staff have all given answers um, and they've been pretty good answers. So I'm keen to see what you say. No pressure. How would you define yourself? Yeah, yeah. Who is Stu? In essence, at the core, who is Stu? I am at my core a muddle of a human being. And I, it means a lot to me to be found in Christ And so I take great delight and comfort in the fact that Christ knows me and the more that I get to know Christ and learn from him, the more I understand myself. Yeah. Yeah. So apart from Christ, I don't actually know who I am, truly. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's how Uh, I feel. Yeah. I think that's pretty similar to most of the other staff, how they've identify themselves so that's good there's consistency yeah. across the team oh good yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well it's quite it's quite a torturous thing i think to try and work out who you are yeah who even knows anyway god does well god does know. <laughs> yeah. yes but no i feel i feel sorry for people like i'm really convinced about jesus and his lordship and increasingly so um and the more i go on in life uh the more i'm really glad that that's a a rudder for life and I f- actually do feel sorry for people who are, are spending their life trying to work themselves out mm. yeah anyway uh, so tell us more about your life what family you have one I'm assuming yeah I, I know yeah. yeah who's in the family Alicia's my wife um, and then we've got three kids William, Anna and Barnaby William's 14 Anna's 12 12 turning 13 soon and Barnaby's just turned 11 yeah. I'm with the Sogo. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I hear there's quite a story about how you and Leash met. Ooh. Uh, okay. So fill us in on that. What's. Oh, well, there's, there's kind of lots of different angles in the story, and there's a short one and a long one, but I'll go for the short one. So the short one is um, we were at the same Bible college. She came to the college when I was in my second year there. She did two years there. Uh, after the first year of us knowing each other, I thought we got along really well. And I, you know, I, I thought I'd like to ask her out. So we, I asked her out for a coffee and she said, yeah, sure. And so we went out for a coffee and we, it was going swimmingly. And I drove her home from the coffee to the, the Bible College campus where we're both living in residence. And I just asked her in the car, so, you know, do you want to, do you want to perhaps, you know, date? Um, and she was just utterly stunned, like shocked. <laughs> yeah. And she said to me, what? 
She goes, um, I thought you were wanting to ask about my friend. She thought that the whole coffee date had been about me like fumbling and being really nervous and wanting to know something about her friend because she thought that I liked her friend and it was not like that at all. I thought that I was just – I thought that we were on the, the, the right track because we were getting along yeah. so well, always yeah. did. And so I was shocked that she was shocked. And then and then she just <laughs> – it was really funny. She goes, oh, um, oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to – I'm going to have to think about that. And she was just in the car stunned and kind of paralysed by this this question. And then I just had to tell her, I said, just how about you just get out of the car? <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, yeah, okay. And that's where that ended. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, How she, far away from uh, Bible college were you? <laughs> oh, no, no, we, we, were, we were, I got back to the Bible college. All right, and, okay. And yeah. So we're back. Yeah, okay. And then she said that she would think about it. She kind of gathered herself and in the next few days said she'd think about it over the holidays. And then she came back after holidays and said, I don't think so. So that was that. And then, and then we, I don't know how long, uh, it might have been six months after that, I, I sort of thought that now she knew that I was interested in her. We continued to get along really well. That's the, correct, the perplexing thing, is we were really good friends and just thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. Um, and I think that in a way that she didn't enjoy other people's company and vice versa. And so I thought, surely, she, you know, she's potentially warm to the idea now. So I, I asked her out again and she politely said, okay, and we went out to, <laughs> we went out to another cafe and, and, um, we ate, you know, had our focaccias, I remember. And, and then I said, so, you know, how about it? Do you know, do you want, do you want to? You know, have you thought any more about it? I'd really like to sort of just date for a bit and see how we go. And um, and she just said straight up this time, no, nah, no. <laughs> and <laughs> I was sure she was going to say yes. And then um, and then I said, well, do you want to live back to college? Like we're about twenty minute walk at least. And she said, no, thanks, I'll walk. <laughs> It felt so cold. Strike dude. So yeah, felt so cold. Like I'd driven her there, and yeah, and so that was pretty crazy. And then finally, like, uh, what? Maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe another six months later, or a year later, even. Um, we we're still serving the same relation, like friendship circles, and and I think someone else kind of nudged me and said you know maybe you should try again I'm thinking what are you, for real and so I just did I went for it and you could have knocked me over with a feather when this time we're having a meal together and she goes yeah I'd like to go out so that was that <laughs> and the rest is history the rest is history <laughs> yeah 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 well that's that's an unusual dating story so I kind of really feel initially I used to just say to guys see perseverance pays off but then it kind of resulted in some people uh, being creepy stalkers. And so now I'm much more careful. I'm like, no, actually, just, yeah. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> be, be careful. That's right. It's good to be persistent, but make sure you also read this, the cues. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, let's rewind a little bit just back before dating, before Bible college, back to early days. Because yeah. you're not from Melbourne. No. Uh, so where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Hobart in Tasmania. I was born in Queenstown on the west coast of Tasmania. So not the glamorous Queenstown in New Zealand, but the the hardcore yeah, west coast Tasmanian mining town. Yeah. And uh, siblings or? Two Actually, sisters, two older sisters. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. So the youngest, the... I'm the the little little annoying kid or the like um, doted on young Depends who you ask. I think I was the the tortured younger brother. My older sisters very much say I was the younger annoying kid, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, did you grow up in a Christian family? Was it a Christian household? Yeah. C- grew up in a Christian, very strongly Christian um, household. Um, quite conservative, pre- Presbyterian church. Um, yeah, I didn't become a Christian though till I was, I don't quite know, but it was 16 or 18. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us that story. How did you kind of come to the point 
was there a one point or was it a, a trajectory over time? How did you become, how did you trust in Christ? Yeah, well, I was a latecomer to the faith. My sisters both sort of just grew into it. They were always kind of Christians. I remember them evangelizing me one time really clearly in, I think it was like the Coles car park. It was a supermarket car park. And they were really hassling me when I was only kind of in primary school, like, why aren't you a Christian? Um, so they were very passionate, strong Christians from the get-go. Um, I went along to a family camp, a Christian family camp in Tasmania. I'm not quite sure how I got to be there, but I was there. And I heard a guy called David Cook, who then ended up being the principal of the Bible college I went to. But David Cook was preaching through Timothy. And I just never, I'd never heard the gospel preached with such clarity and conviction. And for some reason, it just got through to me. So I, at that family convention, that was the first time I'd ever prayed that prayer you know, that I might be forgiven and I'd be in a relationship with God and so on. Yeah, another complicating layer there is um, his family was there as well, including his daughter, who I, I, yeah, I quite fancied. And through one means or another, we eventually ended up dating uh, his daughter and myself. And that kind of helped me. So from 16 to 18, this is what's confusing for me. I was 16 when I went to that camp. But I remember for kind of two years and dating his daughter was kind of in the mix here. But for two years, I kind of really wrestled with whether I really was a Christian and what it meant to be a Christian. And it dredged up all these doubts I had like, you know, am I just a Christian because it's the faith I know? Have I been brainwashed? All of these things. And it, it came to a crisis point when I was in eighteen, uh, when I was eighteen, where very long twisted story, but I, I just, it all clicked one day. I realised that, um, uh, uh, sorry, a little bit of backstory. I, I was tortured by my own ability to trust in Jesus. I was also tortured by the extent of my own sinfulness. I was really wrestling with both those two things. Like, how do I know I believe and how could I be forgiven? And then one day it just really clicked for me that if Jesus rose from the dead, like if it's reasonable at all to believe that, he's got me. It just it was just in one day I realized, you know what? Um, he, he did rise from the dead. Like the most reasonable explanation is he actually rose from the dead. And if that is the case, I don't need to worry about how strongly I believe or how sinful I am. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really encouraging and it's, that's helpful, I think. So that eight, that's kind of the 18 age, end of high school. Yeah, whatever that was, 18, yeah, uh, yep. But then you didn't go on to Bible college straight away. No. What happened next? So I, I, <laughs> I kind of flunked out of high school. The only thing that I kind of could have done was the fine arts and I was sort of interested in it. But I decided to get a job instead. And, um, yeah, I applied for a printing job and a printing apprenticeship. I really had no idea what it was. I I was into surfing at the time and I thought when it said uh, printing apprenticeship, I, I the only thing I knew that was printing was silkscreen printing. And I kind of had this vision of a guy um, uh, down by the beach printing Aloha T-shirts or something, you know, maybe smoking weed. And I thought, oh, that sounds kind of pretty cool. I'll, I'll go and apply for this job. As soon as I walked in the door, I realized this is nothing like what I imagined. Like it was like a small factory, you know, and it's, it's offset printing, like, you know, poster printing, all this kind of stuff. It's all mechanical and machine-based. And I was immediately turned off. I thought, I do not want to work in a factory. And so with that job interview, I was really casual and just relaxed because I didn't want the job. And then they rang me up a few days later and said, congratulations, you know, the apprenticeship is yours and we just loved how relaxed you were. (laughs) And they they said, we think you'll be a really good fit here because you're so relaxed and casual. And I went, oh, no, my gosh. But I thought I've got to do a job, so I'll I'll do it. And that was four years. And um, it ended up being quite a blessing, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so four years through that and then Bible college? Four years and then um, 
I, I actually, sorry, I, I became, I was 18 in the middle of that. Like I became a, a convinced Christian after having started that apprenticeship. Yeah. So then I sort of grew up a bit in my faith and quickly became involved in church. And so that led on to being heavily involved in youth ministry. That led on to working for the church as a two or three day a week paid youth worker. That's what led me to Bible college. So I came to a point where I had to decide either to, I, I wanted to go from printing into graphic design and I was still pretty passionate about that. And then becoming a Christian kind of changed things. And so then there was this fork in the road. Like, and, and I simply asked myself, what's the best way to serve the gospel? Is it best for me to go into full-time ministry of the word and prayer or would it be better for me to pursue graphic design and use that to serve the gospel somewhere or other? Yeah, so I just, to me, it became down, down to a fairly, it was a fairly pragmatic decision. I just thought there are less, especially in the world I lived in at that time, um, there were, good Bible teachers were really scarce. So I thought that's definitely the more important thing. Yep. Yeah, so then you head to SNBC for yep. a couple of years. Yep. Um, but you'd gone from Tasmania to SNBC to Sydney. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you, at, at the end of your SNBC, kind of degree yes why melbourne as in what what was the pull to come back to melbourne yeah well um so yeah interesting so the, the reason i came back to melbourne, melbourne was for the job so my previous boss here at monash a guy called graham chiswell he was looking to move down from sydney to take on the ministry down here at Monash and he was wanting to gather a team to take with him. And somehow or other he got my my name and so he met up for a coffee and, and it sort of went from there. I, I, I just went, yeah, sounds good. I, I, didn't, I wasn't really keen on church parish ministry. So I thought I'd give this a, this a try. Yeah. 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 So now what, how, what's your role? How would you describe your role now as part of CU? Uh, my my well, role part of part of the staff team maybe is the easier way of going about that to start with. Yeah, so my my title would be staff team leader. So I see my role as um, leading the staff team in partnership with students um, to build capacity in the ministry in order to reach the campus. That's, that's my particular role. So I'll use those words carefully. I think, I, I think we're a fairly large ministry and it's a definitely a large staff team. And so I think my particular role is to, is, to put it negatively, is to help us not get in the way of the gospel growing and reaching the campus in positively, to work to help us build capacity in the ministry that we might reach the very edges of the campus. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's take a step back or zoom out, if you will, and think <clears> about <throat> um, student ministry, campus ministry, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, because you're the person that, from the staff point of view, oversees and seems to know and understand the strategy behind it. So let's think about what is CU? Like what's Christian Union in its bare bones? Mm. Well, Christian Union is a student club on the recognised by the university, like a formal, you know, official Monash University club. That's what it is. That that's that's based on the common interest of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And how did CU come about? At least in Australia. Uh oh. That's a good question. And honestly, I'm not quite sure. I know that it's linked to UK. Um, I came out of the student movement in, in UK, but I'm actually really quite vague on exactly the steps to from there to here. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's around Australia and lots of different campuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. so that's, that's right. There was the... Um, I think historically it might have been EU. Yeah, so... Uh, evangelical union, I suppose. And uh, that's a student club that kind of basically spawned other student clubs around Australia on the university campuses. 
Um, and look, I'm guessing that the first one was in Sydney, but I'm not totally sure on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so C has been around for quite a while. It's been around for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. But you don't work for CU, you work for AFES. Yes. So what is AFES and what's its connection to CU? Yep. Um, so, um, yes, it's, it's really interesting. The, the history of the, the EU, the Evangelical Union, um, and these student clubs around Australia, the history was very much student-led. Um, yeah, and I think might have been it might have been post World War Two, I guess World War One or World War Two. I I and again, my gosh, I'm sort of filling in a lot of big gaps here, but I'm pretty sure that's when um, people recognised a need to help the clubs on campus with external resources, and so originally, AFES. Um, was res- helping resource student clubs by offering, you know, for want of a better word, chaplains that would um, kind of go around the campuses and just help them pray with them, I don't know, you know, help help lead Bible studies on occasion or something, you know, mentor some of the student leaders, that kind of stuff. So that was how the model worked for a long time. It was an external, the organisation I work for, AFES, provided this external resource, but it was still um, quite distant from the everyday running of the club. And for those that don't know, AFES stands for Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students. Yes. Just as a helpful thing. Uh, Yeah, So, but that changed gears. Yes. uh, What, 30 years ago or so? Yeah. Um, Um, Talk us through that. Yes. So there's a guy called Andrew Reid who took over as the AFES national director. And what happened was, this is in his, I've, I've talked to him and heard this story firsthand. He said that at the time when he took on that role, a guy called Philip Jensen, who was an Anglican chaplain at UNSW, um, was doing a great work on that campus. And Andrew... Reed was also in Sydney and he went along to that campus. And I think he might have even been posted, yeah, he was posted at that campus as well as an AFES worker. Like their officers might have been there or something. And so he went to him and sort of picked his brains about what he was doing and why he was doing it. And he, he came to the conviction that we need to do this on every campus. Like we need to have a dedicated like chaplain, if you like, who is really committed to the Bible um, and can help. Uh, in a more direct way with Bible teaching and mentoring students and so forth. And so that 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 was a massive change in direction for AFES and it's been extremely fruitful. So now the, I, I, I don't know how many... But all the main campuses are in Australia now, um, as far as I know, would have an AFES staff worker on them in a ne- near to full-time capacity. Yeah, and so their job is to... or The AFES staff job is to complement the students by providing what theologically based training and how would you yeah, describe correct. that? Yeah, correct. The two things there that it's important to clarify is um, the partnership. So um, AFES workers, an external organisation, AFES workers do not just turn up um, and sort of assert some sort of <laughs> authority over the, over the Christian club on campus. There are numerous Christian clubs on many of our campuses around Australia. Um, No, the way this works is that um, uh, a Christian club on campus is invited, if they want to, to affiliate with this external organisation, AFES. And if if they sign up to be an affiliate of AFES, then we, in turn, provide resources. Yeah, so... What that means is that the, the staff come and work alongside the student leaders of the Christian club um, to help run the club. But it's very much in partnership. And here, at least at Monash, and I know pretty much this is the same around Australia, we really stress that we are on the campus ultimately under the authority of the student, the student leadership of the club. Yeah. 
And that, and that affiliation is renewed every year. So if a student club decided at some point, we feel like this is not a benefit to us to have these AFES staff workers working with us, they're completely free to not sign up for the next year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so let's think about that a little bit more. Um, so it's kind of two directions I want to take this. Uh, the first one is, I guess, what's, uh, what's the importance of student ministry? So you, like, you do this full-time, I do this full-time, uh, working for AFES. Uh, we're going into student, like onto campus to help equip students um, to reach the campus for Christ. Uh, why is that so important? Why should we be uh, expending um, theologically trained people in Australia on student ministry? Oh, well, I think it's kind of obvious. Um, the universities are, are, are cultural gatekeepers for society. They, they, in a really significant way, shape culture. Um, and so to have a strong Christian influence on campus uh, from that point of view is a bit of a no-brainer. Like you want the gospel at this pivotal point in a lot of future leaders' lives. Um, and it's also a time when many Christians are going through a particularly formative time in their life. And so if we can have really top quality training for them to access um, with ease, it's a huge benefit both to them and the church broadly. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, it's just kind of this, it's, it's like if you're, if you're fishing to feed a family, um, you know, and, and there's a little, you know, there's this really kind of uh, small pond with stacks of fish and then there's a raging river, which is it's really challenging to catch anything. Of course, you just go to the small pond and just fish away. And I feel like it's just this obvious opportunity to university campuses that it would, it would be negligent to not do something with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering where that illustration was going for a moment. Uh, <laughs> but we got there in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure myself. But yeah. No, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and um, let's follow that through. So uh, AFES staff, um, let's talk real practical for a second. How are they supported? Because the students obviously aren't paying to be part of CU, I, we know. Mm. Um, and so how are AFES staff able to work? on campus, mm. like just practically financially. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I was, my thought immediately went to uh, making a joke about my part-time modelling career. <laughs> that is not very, it's not really working out. It's not really yeah. lucrative. Well, and also people can't see you. <laughs> it's just True. audio. It so doesn't people work listen to at any level. going to be like, oh. Yeah, yeah. So you might be super attractive. We don't <laughs> yeah. know. No, I, I can assure you it's a very low yield <laughs> occupation for me. Um, yeah, no, we're supported um, as, as, as missionaries generally are supported. So another way of looking at AFES staff workers is as missionaries reaching a mission field. And so the church will broadly support missionaries and we're no different. So we personally raise support. That's the model that AFES uses. Each worker raises their own support. But it's all handled um, through a, a, a centralised administration with AFES. So, yep, we, we, we are funded um, by friends and family uh, from people from the churches that we belong to, grads, a whole variety of people help finance what we do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also pray uh, for what we do as well. There's a big support network. Oh, yeah. In Sorry, yes. Regard. In terms of broadly yeah. speaking, yeah, um, we talk in terms of partnership development. And what we mean by that is that we want people to be praying for us um, and financially supporting us, but in so doing, actually being a part of the work that we're doing. Yeah. 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 So yeah, and we want to partner with lots of different people and churches. Yep. In the sense that we want to see many, many people on campus come to know Christ, and for the Christians that come onto campus to be matured, uh, and trained, and grown, and sent back into their churches and into the world um, to make Christ known. It's probably a good sum up of our 
what we want to do as a club and also what we want to do as staff as we come onto campus. Mm. Um, Did you just answer your own question for me? I, I summed up your answer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a much better answer. Thank you, Joel. No worries. Uh, um, yeah, and if you're listening to this and you don't support CU and you're a parent or a friend of a CU and you want to see the, the mission go forward or that you really think this is a valuable thing and valuable ministry, then we'd love to invite you to think about supporting. There's a, a, there's a link that usually is in the show notes of this episode, so you can have a look at that. Uh, but I want to kind of bring us back to one last thing to finish. And that is, uh, putting it pointedly, lots of people, I guess, if they're hearing this the first time and they have no idea about CU uh, or they've just got uh, a friend or a child or they're thinking about CU for the first time, um, might go, what is this random Christian group? Is it a cult or a sect or something, you know, that's kind of this niche little thing on campus that's trying to recruit people desperately from that? How, how, do we re- how would you respond to someone who says, um, is, is CU a cult or is it that kind of thing? Because there are cults active on campus. Yes. Um, that do recruit people from... There certainly are. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, a big thing going for CU is that um, it's a... It's a student club, which means that it's subject um, to all the policies, bylaws or whatever of the university. Um, and any club on campus, particularly the more active ones, are in fact in a pretty close relationship with the powers that be on campus. And so the university is very much aware of all the clubs and people on the student leadership are trained by the club if there was anything really um, wayward or not okay about the club, they just wouldn't be allowed to be a club anymore. So you can, yeah, I think you can have a, a, a pretty high degree of confidence that any official club on campus is fine and safe, and it's a it's a great, it, you know, adds it adds to the university community as far as the university is concerned. The other thing is that AFES is a pretty large organisation and as such um, it it's, has easily accessible um, you know, websites, resources, uh, statements of faith. It's transparent because it's quite large and involved in lots of other Christian networks and with lots of student clubs around Australia. So there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing that's, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to find out about AFES. Yeah, uh, and just thinking about our staff team, Mm-hmm. Um, AFES is in its own denomination. What denominations are on our staff team? Yeah, that's a helpful additional point is that um, all of the staff workers come from uh, churches uh, that they're a part of. I mean, that's a prerequisite to being an AFES worker is that you are a Christian and that means um, being part of a local church. Um, yeah, so we are part of Anglican, Baptist, um, uh, independent churches, yep, from a, a Presbyterian. I don't know if I mentioned that. So, mm. yeah, Presbyterian churches. So, yeah, so all the denominations are pretty much represented um, across AFES around Australia. And in our team, there's even a pretty good um, diversity, but mainline denominations. Yeah. 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 So, let's, let's think about that just a smidge more. Um, what's, what's CU's relationship to church? Yep. If that makes sense. Yeah, maybe this would work better if you present a thesis and I say whether I agree or not. Okay. But yeah, no. <laughs> uh, CU is a church. No one needs any other church outside CU. Nice one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's it, nice. That, uh, you've set me up a softball and I'll smack out of the park. So <laughs> CU definitely is not a church. We do not see it that way. Um, to use the kind of missionary technical terms, which may not mean a lot to listeners, but it's, we call it a parachurch organisation. AFES and even CU, it's a parachurch organisation. That means it's, a, it's alongside the church, but it is not the church. We don't view it as the church. Um, we expect uh, all uh, members of the club to be a part of their local church. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, and on a, it's kind of above, add on and above the local church that we want them to be involved It goes in. back to talk about missionaries. So it's a, it's a missionary organisation and the club is a, is a missionary organisation as well. So it's 
it's like anything like that. Like, you know, overseas missionaries, you know, they're sent out by the church, but they're not the church. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that's hopefully helped clarify a whole lot of things about CU, AFES. What is this thing, this beast that we call Christian Union? Uh, but let's pull it back down to just a practical, personal level. Uh, you've been in CU ministry for a while now, AFES mm. ministry for a while. What's what's a couple of highlights or maybe just one of your time, if you can think of your time as a staff worker, what's, what's been a real highlight? There are simply too many to mention. I, I consider myself deeply blessed to be part of this work because I'm stunned and amazed at the amount of students, high-quality Christian students, who God keeps um, bringing into our path. Um, and uh, a really broad highlight would be walk-up evangelism. When I first came to this campus, for many years, I really plug- plugged away at walk-up evangelism. And um, uh, there's always been a certain appetite for it. But at the same time, for I reckon at least the first five years, maybe seven years, I was constantly having to push it as a staff worker. Um but then at some point, I think about around the eight year or nine year mark or something, it just sort of caught fire and some students came in and took the initiative and really kind of took it out of my hands and didn't even want me there anymore and do it better than I ever did it. And it's just now been a staple part of our ministry. And the fact that that's flourished and is continuing on strong to this day, we used to do it like we used to do that one day a week and it was a stretch for years and years and years. Now it happens, I think the moment it's happening four days a week and it's a highlight for many students. So that's, that's great. A more recent highlight would be we just held a debate you know, between the um, Monash Philosophy Society and the Christians and um, there were, what, I think 400 people in attendance debating the question and I can't remember. Do you remember the question? Is Christian morality better than secular morality? I yeah, that's the, question. that's the import of it. Um, and it just went so well. It's, it's really starting to make our club a presence on campus in a big way, engaging in really important topics and in a way that is positive and winsome. So that's what that debate rep- represented for me. Um, Christians making a lot of noise on campus in a good way. So praise be to God. Mm. Yeah. Uh, is there one, is there a particular story or one particular student that um, comes to mind as a student that you've seen change or grow a lot through, see you become a Christian, um, that kind of thing that is a real highlight out of your time? Uh, well, you, Joel, have come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's that, but I'll tell that story some other time perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, again, that there are a whole podcast to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll unpack that one. Um, there are a lot of students who we've seen sort of come and grow and go on to to bigger and better things. I think that a, a one in recent memory is a guy called Colin. He might even listen to this podcast. So, hello, Colin, if you're listening to it. But um, it, I really distinctly remember him coming in as a first year. And we had another student at that time who I think might have been the president called Josh Davis, who was very charismatic and stuff. And I remember chatting to a group of the these these blokes after our talk one night. You know, Joe Ash is kind of holding court and here's this guy, Colin, who's a first year, who was just kind of really shy and reserved and retiring. And and he quickly went from that to um uh, really growing rapidly in this Christian faith, um, becoming bold, getting involved. He became the president, went straight into an apprenticeship, went off to Bible college, all in quick succession. And I think he's a really fantastic Christian leader now. And um, it's exciting to see where he'll go. So, But you know what? I could, I, could, I could time that story, I don't know how many, maybe tenfold, lots of people like that. So praise be to God again. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, something that we like to do at the end of this podcast is um, commit our time to God and commit the, the campus mission to God. And so would you like to pray for us as we close? I would love to do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much.
for the way you work powerfully uh, in this world to draw people in under the lordship, the saving lordship of Christ. And I'm always so grateful and we're so grateful that we can be a part of Christ's mission to save in this world. Um, as your body, we get to participate in that. Please, God, continue to sustain and bless the work here at Monash and keep opening doors for us and help us to proclaim the word uh, boldly as we ought. In your son's name, I'm in. I'm in. Thank you for listening to this Monash Christian Union Bible Talk. We long to see everyone at Monash University know a disciple-making disciple of Jesus Christ. If you have been blessed by this ministry and would love to support Monash Christian Union, you can do so via the link in the podcast description.